people than you. <laughs> They're important too. Otherwise, I would I would not think about them. I slept in. Poor Michael was here by himself at probably five o'clock. <laughs> Good morning for those of you that are up, <laughs> like us, <laughs> who don't know any better and decide on Labor Day to get up early and labor, to labor today. But hey, you know, I, I, and I was thinking about this, couldn't sleep at all last night. A lot of prayer for Mario. Uh, I was a little worried, because um, when God wakes you up, I mean, cl crystal clear like that. Mm -hmm. You, know, you think, okay, Lord, I'm praying, I'm praying hard. So for hours I, I prayed. But I did have some time to squeeze in there about Labor Day and what it was. You know, so I looked it up. And, you know, of course, all those who have labored for this great nation of ours and have caused our nation to prosper. You know, so you can think back to the, uh, the founding fathers and all the work that uh, went into creating such a, a wonderful nation as ours is today. And that's why we celebrate this holiday, so for all those employees, and I guess in a sense, we're all employees unless you, well, we're all employees, even those that own the companies are responsible to the board members <laughs> and to their uh, stockholders, so to all those that have labored in this great nation, but uh, we're here this morning because, hey, why not? Why not start off right with the Lord? And, and you know, I was thinking about this also, this Devo is a instructional tool for all of us because we shouldn't just come on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We should be doing this every day. So taking time on our own on Tuesday and Thursday and opening up our Bible in a book and just reading through it and being blessed by it and then starting the day, you know, on the right foot and with the blessings of the Lord. I think that's a, a wonderful way to start, to get up in the morning, get on your hands and knees and pray. And then sit down with a cup of coffee, open up your Bible, and just read the scriptures, and then hopefully the Lord ministers to you and you start your day uh, well. So, good morning, Mark. I see you're up after a long night. <laughs> um, all right, let's open up our Bibles to Romans chapter 4. Everyone else, uh, thanks for joining us, or if you're joining us later on and viewing this, uh, this video on Facebook, glad you saw it. Please share it. As we continue in Romans chapter 4, chapter 4, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for bringing us here this morning on this beautiful day, Lord. Every day is a beautiful day with you, Lord, and every day we should sit with you, Father. And I thank you, Lord, that I don't tire of reading your word. I don't tire of gathering and fellowshipping with other believers, Lord God. It's something that you have just uh, instilled in me, Lord, by your grace and your mercies towards me, Father. I could do this 24-7, uh, Lord, and I love it, Lord. It's a part of my life now, Lord, and I really enjoy it. And I just pray, Lord, that you will use it, Lord, for your glory, to just minister to others, Father. There's such a, a love that God has for us that is so amazing. I'm blown away by it, Lord, because I never measure up, Father. <clears throat> I try, Lord, to do the best I can, but then I just commit the rest to you, Lord, knowing that um, my faith and your work through your Son uh, will cover all those areas of my life that I lack. And I can have faith and not fear and not even condemn myself because that work was so great, Lord. And so I thank you for it, Father. And I appreciate it, Lord. And I appreciate your love, Father, for all of us. For you did, Lord, Father, love the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so minister to us now, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If those of you are watching, um, we are here at the church, by the way, even though it's a holiday, so it makes no sense, right? But we love the Lord. Um, I opened up the front door so people can come in uh, thinking we were going to be packed here this morning, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we are. There's there's six of us here. <laughs> All right, so Romans. Now, I don't know about you, but Romans, you know, I've, I've spoken to pastors that have felt Revelation is a very hard book to, to study and also to give a study in. And, and literally some pastors that won't even touch it. Um, so they haven't taught through it in years. 
for me, Romans is just a hard book for me to really understand and grasp. I don't know why that is. Um, it's just one of those books that I have to, you know, read each chapter over and over and over to try to figure out what is Paul really saying, and then go to some commentaries to see, you know, what their thoughts are um, pertaining to this. But when you read Romans, especially in the first few verses, uh, chapters, he, he is really talking about the law and grace, and he's giving so many analogies and comparisons. Uh, and instructions on how those two are so different from each other. Uh, we, we tried yesterday at church to explain the commandments and, and why God gave those commandments. And I, you know, I walked away from that message just thinking I didn't do a good job. You know, I, I, I wanted to be so much more clear that someone would grab it and say, oh, that makes so much sense and begin to apply it to lives. And maybe some did, I don't know. I don't know yet, but I just felt like that, that, that I didn't do the job well enough. It could have been done better and clearer because that is an area, and I think that the enemy is involved with that, right? Because that is an area where we really need to understand the grace of God and the law of God and how they work in our lives. Uh, even understanding the grace of God, sometimes we find ourselves just because of our sin nature and the enemy, we find ourselves doing things according to the law, and then we think that God owes us something. Even though we understand he doesn't, because his grace is just favor on us, he doesn't owe us a thing, but we expect something. When we do something good, then we expect God to do good to us. And that isn't the case. When we do something good, it's because we love him and we're not expecting things from him. And, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, you know, the church, because it's a ministry and there's so much here, and sometimes we pray for various ministries, and so sometimes, like David, we'll say, Lord, haven't I done this and done that? Why won't you bless us, Lord, even more? Give us opportunities, you know, and so forth. And so your prayer is really saying, haven't I done this and this, so why aren't you blessing us? Instead of saying, Lord, you are just so gracious, wouldn't you just bless us even more than what you've blessed us now? Because those things that we have done were things that were done because we love him, not because we want more from him. I don't know if that even makes sense, but that's the challenge that we have uh, in trying to understand the law and works. And so in chapter 4, Paul is trying to make it clear that it's not of works, not of works, not of circumcision, not of baptism, but it's really of faith that we approach Jesus Christ. So let's go ahead and, and read um, in chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say? that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh. For if Abraham was justified by works, he had something of which to boast, but not before God. So in this chapter, Paul is going to use Abraham uh, as an illustration to works and faith, or law and faith, um, or in grace. Now he says, if Abraham who is our founding father, right? God went to the land of Chaldeans and chose Abraham to be uh, the man that he would create a great nation through. Um, and many people would be blessed because of his seed. And of course, we saw Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob and then you know the 12 sons of Israel and then Israel growing and then the Messiah coming in through Israel and then the Messiah uh, ministering to 12 men and then Paul the apostle joins them and then the gospel goes out to the world to the Gentiles. So through Abraham, it just came and flowed to the whole world. And so Paul uses him as an example, and he is a great example of this. You know, why did God choose Abraham? Was it because of his works, or was it because of his grace? And so he says in verse 2, if Abraham was justified by works, he would have something of which to boast about. So he's saying there that it wasn't because of his works. Otherwise, Abraham could say, see, I'm a pretty good guy. And Paul says that in Ephesians. Let's see if I can turn there real quick without taking too much time. If I only knew my Bible, where are we at? Uh, Ephesians 2. Bear with me. <clears throat> 2.8. I do have it memorized, but I just wanted to look at it while I 
<clears throat> quoted it. <clears throat> Paul comes to this conclusions in Ephesians <clears throat> that he's sharing in Romans. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. So it's the favor of God, because grace means favor, unmerited. We can't do anything for it, and he doesn't expect anything for it. And it's constant flowing towards us, his favor. But it's appropriated, it's taken hold of uh, by faith. We have to have faith. We have to believe, we have to trust, we have to cling to uh, that grace that God has provided for us through his son, Jesus Christ. And it says, not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. And then he goes on and says, not of works least anyone should boast. And so he says here that if Abraham did this by works, then he could boast. And so it can't be by works. It's got to be by, by faith. <clears throat> For what does the scripture say, verse 3? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Uh, the word accounted there is the word imputed, and you've heard that word before, imputed, right? God's imputed righteousness, it's accounted to us. The word imputed uh, means in a sense that uh, God has put it towards our account. And I, I always use the analogy of a checking account. You know, if, if you're poor and you have you know, very little, you're, you're making ends meet, you may have $1,000, but by the end of the month you have $5, you know, and so you're making ends meet. <clears throat> but all of a sudden if somebody imputes or puts into your account a million dollars, you know, not because you're special. They're not related to you. You know, they just impute to you a million dollars. That's yours now. And you can draw from it any time. People would go crazy and probably spend it all, but it's there for you. And so God's righteousness, which is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, has been imputed to our account. And so we can draw from his righteousness at any time. So it's accounted to him for righteous. So like Abraham, because he believed what God said, that God would make him a father of many nations, and many nations would be blessed, God accounted that as righteousness to him, his faith in him. Now to him who works, the wages can, uh, are not counted as grace, but as debt. But if you work, and you're under the law, then it's just you're indebted uh, to the law. But to him who does not work, but believes on him, that is Jesus, who justifies the ungodly, has faith, is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. There's that word again, imputes. And this is what David said. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Isn't that amazing? That our lawless deeds have been forgiven, the deeds in the past. Well, <clears throat> once in a while, God reminds me of my past. Maybe the enemy reminds me of my past to condemn me. But God also reminds me of my past, where I came from, and how much grace he has had on me. Um, I look back and I can see uh, so much uh, sinfulness in my life, so much selfishness, self-centeredness, and God saved me from that. Uh, and as David said here, he has forgiven me of all of those deeds, and I'm blessed, I'm happy. I remember when I got on my knees in my company truck asking God to forgive me and wash away all my sins, and it literally felt like a weight was removed from my shoulders. Um, I don't know how to explain that, but it's maybe it's the, you know how sometimes there's a burden on you? There's stress on you, there's anxiety on you, and then something happens in your life where all of a sudden that just seems to be lifted off you, and it almost seems like you're lighter. That's how it felt like to me when God said, your sins are forgiven, all of them from the past, and I remember them no more. And it was like a weight was lifted up, and I'm like, this is amazing grace. And I appropriated that into my account. And boy, did I draw from it, you know, day after day, just, just serving the Lord from a pure heart. He goes on and says, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is a man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So there's that word again, imputing. So without Christ, unfortunately, 
sin has been imputed to you. You're naturally a sinner, and in your account is sin. And because the wages of sin is death, one day when you stand before God, you'll be separated from God in eternity. Let's go back to the account analogy. So you're making ends meet, <clears throat> but nobody puts into your account uh, a million dollars. So you're living off of what you make, and it's not enough. So you get a credit card, and you're able to use the credit card. But now that $5 at the end of the month isn't there anymore, so you get another credit card to pay off the credit card. And you find yourself getting in debt and getting in debt, and then you get to a point where all of a sudden the debtors are saying, you know what, it's time to pay up, and there's no way you can pay up. So now you're judged. You, you now have been imputed sin, and the consequences of that sin now leads to total um, bankruptcy. And now you have to file that bankruptcy or give away everything you own and be judged for that. And so sin always leads to death, and it's been imputed to you. So it doesn't make any sense uh, for those out there to not impute the righteousness of Jesus Christ and tr trust in him. So David <clears throat> understands that, that God has forgiven him of his great sin. And I think that's why David was a man after God's own heart, right? Because he understood his sin. And boy, was he a sinner, wasn't he? I mean, he, even after the fact. I mean, he was out there in the fields tending the sheep and keeping the bears and the lions away, doing his job, and God calls him. And he understands that calling. That it's by grace. It's by grace. It has nothing to do with David. I mean, if it had to do with David's righteousness or his statute or his power, his strength, he would have chosen one of his brothers because they were bigger and better than David was. And Jesse said, I don't have any more sons but, but David. And Samuel said, well, God looks at the heart and not at the outward appearance. And David knew that. that God looks at the heart and saw that this was a man that was after my own heart. He wasn't perfect. He made a lot of mistakes. <clears throat> he struggled even within himself. And even at a later age in life when kings did no longer fight because there was peace in the land and he was in his house overlooking you know, the land and he saw Bathsheba there and we know that. And it not only led to adultery, but it led to murder, too. And yet, yet, God said, David was a man after my own heart. He had imputed to David such a righteousness that it covered all of that. And David knew that. And, and Paul will say later on, where grace, or, or where sin is, grace much more abounds. And where there's more sin, grace even abounds more and more. And you go, wow, Lord. That's amazing. It's amazing grace. And, and the sailor... I can't, what's his name? It starts with the B. Who's, who wrote that song about the sailor who was transporting Africans uh, from Africa to the United States in his ship while many were dying and living in, in, in their feces and, and disease and so forth. And he himself literally almost died while he was transporting them while something hit him during a storm. And he realized that God's grace saved him. He was able to be pulled out of the ship, Lamford, I believe it is. Um, and he realized, wow, what amazing grace. Here I am transporting human lives, trafficking for profit, and I should be dead, and God yet saved me. And so he wrote the song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that would save a wretch like me. It is amazing grace. Verse 9. <clears throat> Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcision only, or the circumcised only, or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe through, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who do not only are of the circumcision, but 
who also walk in the steps of the of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. So he's making a point here concerning Gentiles. Because the Jews, again, remember they questioned when we were reading the book of Acts, they questioned Paul uh, talking, uh, ministering to the Gentiles and telling them that they needed, didn't need to follow Moses' law and they had to come together and make a decision uh, pertaining to the Gentiles. Well, they're uncircumcised. He's saying here, well, how did Abraham receive this imputation? Was it while he was circumcised? No. It was while he was uncircumcised. So why can't the Jews then, I mean the non-Jewish people, the Gentiles, the, the, the Greeks, the barbaric, why can't they receive the same imputation? They can through Jesus Christ. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect because the law brings about wrath for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of faith of Abraham who is father of us all. Again, he uses that grace. So he's thinking of Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace, we have been saved through faith. And it's not of ourselves, at least we can boast. It's not anything that we have done of our own righteousness. But notice that he mentioned that all of us, including Gentiles, are of the seed of Abraham because we have appropriated, imputed God's righteousness just like Abraham did through faith. As it is written, verse 17, I have made you a father of many nations to Abraham in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So he's using again the example of, of the birth of um, Isaac that that was even appropriated by faith, even knowing that, hey, I'm an old guy, there's just no way that we can have kids, my wife is old. Uh, I don't think that's gonna happen, but he believed God. Now, it's interesting, because when you go back to Genesis and you read the story, there was some doubt on Sarah's part, wasn't there? You know, and you see that, but yet, God gave her the measure of faith to believe that God could do something like that, and so he accounted, even though it was a small measure of faith, he accounted that as righteousness to them. So he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. <clears throat> you know, when you go back up to where he says that, um, and I hope I can find it, where God says he takes those things which do not exist as though they did. That's an interesting phrase, right? God sees things before they even exist. Well, he's God. He sees past, present, and future. It's like the children of Israel, when they were going into the promised land, he, he told Moses, look, you can't go in, Moses, because you represented me incorrectly. Uh, you presented me as an angry God towards Israel, and I'm not an angry God. And so he was not allowed to go into the promised land, but God says, I'll let you at least see it. And so he took him up on the mountain, and God showed him the land that would be Israel's. And then he began to tell him this, that's where Reuben will be, that's where Ishkar will be, that's where Ephraim will be. And he said, those things that are not right now, because they're not happening yet, but that's where they will be. He saw them as they were. And that's what Paul is saying here, um, that the things that uh, do not exist, um, though they do not exist, as though they did. And somehow God knew because Abraham and Sarah had enough faith, even though.